We are talking today about a lot of things changing in the venture industry. We are in Los Angeles. One of the things that I think has changed the most in the venture industry in the last few years is the involvement of entertainment and media and that becoming an internet property. And <clears throat> for those of you don't, who don't know, my guest here is Troy Carter. I think in Los Angeles, everybody knows you. <laughs> Uh, and Troy Carter invested in Lyft, Uber, Dropbox, Warby Parker from pretty early stages. So some names I guess most of these people have heard of. And <clears throat> what I want to do is start with the recent history of your successes. And then I want to go all the way back to the start. Okay. More recently, I think you became really well known for discovering and touring with Lady Gaga. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, if my facts are correct, when you started, neither of you guys had any money. You guys were kind of hustling around getting gigs, traveling California or the country. And what I want to know is, what did it take? Talk a little bit about the experience of Lady Gaga and how she broke out, how you helped her break out as an act, and then what parallels you see for entrepreneurs at early stages and how they break out? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, thank, thanks for having me, Mark, and a uh, pleasure to be, to be here. Um, I think the common denominator and the one word is, is really hustle. And, um, you know, when I think Gaga and I met when she was 20, and um, so that was probably 2000, 2007. And, um, and at that time, you know, it was like height of the, you know, financial crisis. Um, you know, I had just gone through a terrible period in, in, in my life financially around that time. She had just got, she, she just got dropped from Def Jam Records and um, she was, had, was living on her grandmother's couch in West Virginia, kind of licking her wounds after she uh, got dropped from Def Jam. So when we got introduced, it was this sort of uh, neither one of us have nothing to lose. Yeah. Uh, you can't fall off the floor, so you know let let's get to work, and um, and we just hustled. You know, we started it off, and and can I ask one question? I'm sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. What did you see in her like this? Because I want to peel back the onion on people discovering tech deals. Like, mm -hmm. What did you see in Gaga? You know what? She she came in very confident, sure sure of herself. Um, you know, I, I had this office at the time where, you know, a friend, the friend who introduced us brought, us to, to, brought her to my office and, um, and, you know, she came in with, you know, the fish, fishnet stockings, no pants on, big glasses, and probably played us what would be four number one records. You know, so the, 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 the product was there. Yeah. Um, she knew how to, how to sell the product, and I think she just needed somebody on her team who could do the blocking, tackling, and strategy. And, uh, and that's where I came into play. So what did you do? You know, we just hit the ground. We put the rubber to the road. So we played, we probably played this club. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we played, you know, four or five clubs a night in LA sometimes. Did the same thing in New York. Um, really focused on where uh, this whole philosophy around the first 50. How can we find the first 50 fans? And in New York, she was already playing small clubs to the gay community, um, and we, we saw that it was a warm reception there. So right. how can we double down on that? How can we play to the gay community in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and kind of, and we brought on a consultant in that space who had relationships with all the clubs and helped us build it up from there. Was there a defining moment where it just kind of broke out like you know what no it was it was a series of inflection points so it wasn't one you know just that explosive one thing happened it was us planting seeds in every place and what was great you know and kind of would doves tail into you know how I even got involved in tech we couldn't get her music played on the radio to save our lives, you know, so where all of the radio stations told us, you know, it wasn't a fit for the stations, it wasn't pop music. So we were using a lot of early stage technology companies like Facebook that was coming out of .edu, uh, Twitter, 
um, YouTube, all of these platforms as marketing tools. And what was happening is, and that was different from when I first started my career, all of a sudden you put up a, a, a video on YouTube and you're not just famous in the United States anymore. There, uh -huh. There's a group of young gay kids, you know, who are this, this counterculture punk rock group in the UK that started like in the videos and in Australia and all of these other places. And so one of the things we talk to tech entrepreneurs a lot about is not trying to strike lightning in a bottle, not thinking that you're necessarily up and to the right from day one. It sounds like that was the experience. It took a you, year to yeah. get it played on the radio. And so how do you take that experience and how do you how do you advise or work with tech startups in similar ways? You know, we talk a lot about narrative, you know, and that was the whole thing, you know, so as we're breaking artists, you know, and our company is, is on the music side is known for developing and breaking talent, right? And, um, and what I learned over the years is that it's, it's the same thing. It's never as much as it may seem like, you know, it happens really quickly. It doesn't. It's always about a narrative. So if I can get one pop station or one rock station to play this record, it gives me a story to go and tell the person in the market next door. So in Gaga's case, we got um, airplay. We couldn't get it played in America, so we had a small station in Canada that started playing it that allowed me to go to Buffalo right. and to be able to tell the guys that's in great. Buffalo, your neighbors next door are killing this record, you know? And that, that's what kind of spread it, you know, throughout America. And if I had to select emerging music artists, God help the listeners. <laughs> How did you make the transition from being able to know Lady Gaga walking in and say that's talent to tech companies? I mean, how did you source Uber, Lyft, or as I know, it was Zimride back then? How did you source this? How did you know this from all the crappy deals? You know, my, 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 I think, you know, I'm, I'm probably one of the most untalented people you'll find when it comes to anything music related, right? So I don't play an instrument. I can't sing to save my life or anything like that. But um, I got a knack for uh, discovering and being attracted to very talented people. And there's a curiosity that comes along with it. So whether it's a fine artist who paints, whether it's um, a music producer, whether it's a pianist, or whether it's an entrepreneur, if, if it's something creative, it automatically attracts me to that person to ask more questions. And, um, and in tech, I just happen to be, meet some great entrepreneurs who introduced me to other great entrepreneurs. Um, I think the fact that I'm a founder helps me relate to other entrepreneurs yeah. and um, and you get you get lucky you get lucky in a sense of I got lucky enough to build great relationships and be useful and have a very powerful network that was attractive to people in technology so for instance you know one I met Shervin Pishavar through Summit Series just through a random conversation. We're sitting next to each other. I overheard something he said that was, you know, he, he said something along the lines of, uh, there's no neutral forces in your life. People either add value or, or extract value. Yeah. And we kind of built this conversation around it. And when he was leaving, when he sold his gaming company, he was talking about going to become an investor. We were doing jam sessions around it. And he said, well, when I start investing, we're gonna form this sort of Jedi force, right? And we did, and the first deal he bought me, you know, he, he introduced me to Neil and Dave from Warby Parker. Right. Neil and Dave and I became friends, I invested. Second deal uh, he bought me was uh, Uber. And uh, Travis and I became friends and I en ended up investing. And as, when, as Shervin was activating his LA network, I, en I brought on Jay-Z and the Rock Nation guys. I brought on Will Smith and the Overbrook guys. And it's like this sort of compounded influencer network that, that's been able to, um, to, to be very helpful in, in getting in other deals and stuff as well. So you grew up in West Philly. West Philly. You Dropped out of high school. Got Is kicked, that right? Got kicked out got of a few out. and then dropped out of the, <laughs> la, the, the last one. <laughs> and if I understand from some of the earliest days, you found a way to get on the radar screen of Will Smith, of DJ Jazzy Jeff, of you worked with P. Diddy, you worked with Biggie. Uh, 
what did you learn from that experience, and what has that brought to what you do now? You know, um, you know, I, I've I've had the the beauty um, and blessing of being able to work with some fantastic people. Um, I met Will Smith when I was probably 17 years old. We had this rap group called Too Too Many. And we said, if we ever meet Will Smith, he's gonna give us a record deal. So we used to hop the train down to his recording studio every day trying to meet him for like six months and uh, wait outside in the snow. And, uh, and finally, one day, one of our buddies was recording and he let us in and we played our demo tape. Um, we found out we sucked pretty quickly, but, but Will respected the, uh, our, the hustle and the fact that you know, he thought we were good kids and he took me under his wing. And, um, and from Will, when he came out to LA to do Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, um, right down the street at Sunset Gower Studio, it was eye-opening you know, for a kid who had never been outside of Philadelphia before. All of a sudden, I had this exposure to the media business. And then um, I went back to uh, Philly and started promoting concerts, and I would promote all of the hip-hop concerts in Philly. And, um, and one of the shows I was promoting was with a new artist named Notorious B.I.G., who was a no-show at the concert. <laughs> and, um, but his, his label head and Biggie still came down that night after the show was over, and seeing P. Diddy, who, was, who owned the label in action, was really my first time seeing a young black guy be the owner of something, command a room, although the room was a nightclub, but it was like, you know, he could kind of commanded the room. And I said, I want to come work for you. You know, tell me, what do, what do you do? And he said, well, your first job is going to be to get me the girl from behind the bar. And um, I got him the girl from behind the bar. And then I started working for P. Diddy a couple weeks later, but it was a master class in hustle. You know, seeing, seeing this guy build this company up from the ground up, build some of the biggest stars um, in the world at that time, gave me the confidence and the ability to be, that I was able to do it. You know, because it's a big thing, like if you can't, if you, if you can't see it, it's hard to be it. Yeah. So he gave me my confidence that, okay, P. Diddy's father got killed when he was a kid in Harlem. I grew up without my father in, in my life. My dad was in, in prison for, mo for, for most of my life. And, um, you know, grew up poor, kind of, you know, um, lots of love, but no money. And um, so it, it showed me that there was a path. Right. Now, <clears throat> I think one of the narratives in Silicon Valley right now is that, um, we sort of end up with a bias, uh, an unplanned bias, where you end up funding people who look like you mm -hmm. or had a similar journey mm -hmm. or maybe fit an archetype, which is socially awkward, Harvard, Stanford, dropout, MIT dropout, white, male. It's funny, Silicon Valley, they have all, all of this, it, it was, uh... When I first heard the whole thing, I never heard the phrase uh, like unconscious bias or whatever. I said, we used to call that racism, yeah, right? Yeah, that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we, we got we to clean it up and put, and put a bow on it, but it's, it's unconscious bias, right? Yeah. So, um, maybe I'll try to define it. Mm -hmm. I think racism is when you are overtly hateful or hate other people and unconscious is when you make choices that you don't acknowledge are built by biases that you have. Mm -hmm. How do we break that barrier? You know, I think it's going to break its, it's going to break itself, right? You know, as, as we look at investing, you know, um, prior to s probably five or six years ago, I had never heard the term venture capital before, right? So for me, you know, I've been, I've, I've had a knack for being able to build businesses, um, invest in people, and, um, and I kind of dedicated my, li my life to that, right? And it was, but I've always been able to find opportunity, and the way hip, hip hop's a multi-billion dollar business, 
um, and it was built off of, um, off of an opportunity that nobody else saw, right? Because they didn't understand the culture. So in the very beginning, we took our labels to you know, the big conglomerates and they said, well, this isn't music, we don't really understand the music or whatever. So it kind of forced us into building these independent labels and these independent companies. We would come up with fashion lines and go to companies like Tommy Hilfiger and it was, okay, no, we want that look from Nantucket. We don't necessarily want these hip hop guys wearing our clothes or whatever. So it forced entrepreneurs like Russell Simmons to start Fat Farm or right. Diddy to start uh, Sean John and you know and Damon John from Shark Tank to start FUBU and built these multi uh, you know million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in value with these companies. So what we recognize in technology as investors you have a huge demographic shift that's happening in America, globally right now, right? Um, one shift is, you know, just this whole generation Y, right? And, you know, we're seeing it in elections, right? You know, where um, people are wondering why Bernie Sanders could get 50% of the vote when, you know, with talk about socialism and all of these things, but it's really about authenticity. That, that's what people see in Bernie, is, is this whole thing about authenticity and transparency, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, they see it in Donald Trump as, as, as well, but it's, you know, it's, it's the reality of the world that we live in right now. So it's this huge shift in mindset, but also a huge shift in demographics. So if we look at America and this whole thing around uh, the majority minority of what the country is gonna look like, any Fortune 500 company, you look at the cover of Time this week and uh, Mattel stepped up and changed the face of Barbie. Right. Barbie looks a lot different than she looked, you know, decades ago and even three and weeks ago. Back, back to the need to be able to see yourself and have role models. I don't want to run out of time without asking you about cross-culture. Mm -hmm. And this is the only bit that I have to ask to be off the record because when you have a VC fund and when it raises money, you can't be talking about it publicly. Uh, but you've kindly agreed to talk about it. Now, cross-culture is a venture fund. Mm -hmm and your objective is to fund any great tech business, but maybe a specific emphasis on the changing cultural values and demographics of the U.S. Am I right in that? Yeah, it's like, you know, I think everybody, every, every great investor uh, has, has a lens, right? You know, of, of, of how they see the world, what their philosophy is, what their thesis is ar around investing. And I think, you know, uh, really understanding consumer behavior and how it plays into investing is, uh, is how we b started to build cross-culture. So, you know, being able to recognize demographic trends, being able to look at a small company in the Nordic territories that erat was eradicating piracy like Spotify and being able to say, okay, you know what, this is a, a shift in consumer behavior, you know, um, and that's why we were able to, you know, invest in Spotify. Even our investment with you with Skirt yeah. is and looking at um, just this whole idea around ownership and transportation and density and, and, and giving, giving up car, car ownership. Uh, you know, so we kind of look at it through this through a lens of uh, investing through really understanding consumer behavior, but through both data and feel. Right. And you have a couple of partners. Yes, at, I think they here. Yeah. I, oh, I'm, right here, I'm, second yeah, row. Quite sure there. <laughs> and uh, so, what do you? How do you balance Atom Factory, Smash Labs? Did mm -hmm. I get the name right? And the fact that you represent talent, I guess Megan Trainer, and you still do some, like how do you balance your time and what do you see your role in the venture fund being? You know, I just, I think I decided um, a while ago, you know, because when I first started investing, it was, it kind of felt like, okay, these are two different areas or whatever. And then I realized quickly that, you know, founders and artists have a ton in common, right? You know, and our platform uh, was just as beneficial to portfolio companies as they were to, to artists. So when I can take, you know, a founder and say, hey, I can introduce you to, whether it's Coca-Cola, General Motors, the head of Fox Studios, or, you know, the CTO of Cisco, you know, it's, um, it's, it, it, acceler it helps accelerate that company's business. So we designed a platform to, to empower artists and entrepreneurs. You know, so that's what I'm personally passionate about. That's what I get up every morning ex 
excited about. And we designed the entire company so every team member in the company kind of works across all facets of the business. So you could be working with the CEO of Lyft today, but you could be working with Megan Trainer uh, tomorrow, and it all kind of coincides. One of the things I've observed about the power of LA, the thing that really LA I think is coming to its fore right now is this ability to combine talent and spokespeople and brand and access that most startups crave in order to break through the noise or monetize. Um, and there are very few people who come from that background who also understand tech and entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial journey. And I just wanted to say, you represent the best of that. I just watching Thank you, you and how you interact with our ecosystem has been fantastic. And may we have five more Troy Carters. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate <laughs> thank you. it.